Radio Richard. The, the show is called What is Melody? And then the reason I got into this thing is I was, you know, doing some teaching, one day doing a master class, and I was talking about the importance of writing things that have strong melodies. And so some kids said, well, what is a strong melody? What is melody anyway? What is a melody? So I thought, you know, it's an interesting question. The lay person, if they could ask, what is... And so what I've been doing is going around asking people from the classical world, from the pop world, from the rock world, from the jazz world, what is melody? How would you define it? I can't imagine how you define it. It's one of those completely indefinable things. I mean, in, in one sense, a melody is any collection of notes put one after the other. If you were to do one finger thing on a piano, any random notes, it would be a melody. Now, it's in the ear of the listener as to what kind of melody it is. I mean, the difference between a, a Bach melody and a Leggetti melody is hugely different. Can you talk about that just for a second? Well, one of the things that I, I, I dislike about very contemporary vocal writing sometimes is the sort of gratuitous use of stupid intervals because they're desperately trying not to be conventional. <laughs> and there are only 12 notes, so there's, a, you know, there's, a, there's, a, um, there's only so many things you can do. So in order not to do any of those, they do these ridiculous. Now, the, the, in, in my opinion, the best, absolutely the best um, modern, in the modern era um, vocal writer was Benjamin Britten. It was partly because uh, I, I think he had a natural uh, understanding of melody and also his association with Peter Piers. So when he was writing his music, you know, they were together every day, so when he was writing his music, he would say to Peter, what do you think of this? And he would sing it, and if it sounded good, he'd keep it, and if it didn't, he wouldn't. <laughs> you know, which is, a, which is a very good way to go about it. Yeah. Um, it's, it is, of course, a lost art. And so when people in your class saying, what's the melody, I'm not surprised because there are none anymore, practically. I mean, you listen to the radio, you, you, there isn't a melody you can shake a stick at. They're all, I don't know what they are. They are, of course, a collection of notes, mm. but they're not what any of us call a melody. Mm. It, it, uh, to me, it, maybe uh, it's a question of melodies that you hear today seem to be completely generic without any kind of personality. Uh, would you agree with that? Well, they are. That's exactly what they are. They are completely generic. But the problem is that seems to be a demand for generic type melodies. Why? Well, I mean, you know, we won't get too deeply into this, but it's for the same reason that the culture's going down the toilet because everything is down to the lowest common denominator. So the the great unwashed out there, they don't know about melodies. They've probably never been exposed to them. They've ever heard and you know, it's, and so that's the problem. And, and, and I remember my youngest son who's now not saying he's 26 now, has had a rock and roll band for four or five years. When he was quite young and was listening to gangster rap, I said to him one day, you know, I'm not really terribly keen on the content of this stuff that you're listening to. What is it that's so attractive about it to you? I said, in, in a nice way. I wasn't being confrontational, just in a nice way. Oh, it's the beat, Dad. Well, that's it, you see. The people out there, when they hear Britney or whoever it is, they're not listening to the song, they're listening to the beat. That's all they're listening to. Because that's as much as they can deal with. They can't deal with the rest, you know. This is so in order for them not to be put off, it has to be very simple, it has to be generic, and it has to be like everything else. So everything sounds the same, then they don't get upset, you see. They don't get worried about, you know, oh dear, what's this? I mean, I've, I'm going to give you a copy of my album, right? You haven't had a copy of it, have you? You ran it off of your computer because I, you didn't I, have I'll any. give you a proper one. That's well, this is an album I made for my sins 10 years ago. It's taken me 10 years to find a record company to put it out. I don't know how to describe it. It's like it's somewhere between classical music and not classical music. And it was the London Symphony Orchestra. It's in, almost entirely instrumental. And it's pretty special. Though you I say, say so that myself. again. No, I say so myself. When it was released here three or four months ago, it was reviewed by some guy who people go to to reviews and then it appears in Billboard and Variety and all these things. It was about as bad as you can get. At the end he said, this music is suitable for elevators and dentists waiting rooms. Now, 
It doesn't tell me anything about my music, but tells me everything I need to know about him. Well, it's pretty dangerous when people like that are out there pontificating about real music, because that's what people read. Mm. You know, it appeared on iTunes and it appeared in Billboard, and so you know you're already behind the blackboard before you even started. Mm. And he used the word elitist, and he hated the fact that it was what he called elitist music. Mm. Now, what he actually means by that is his music written for musical people. Assuming that musical people are an elite group, which of course they are becoming <laughs> more and more so. <laughs> right? Mm. Mm. <laughs> you understand what I mean? Sure. We're not talking about much about melody, I'm sorry sure. about this. No, but, no, uh, you are very definitely talking about exactly what I wanted you to comment on. And the other thing that's important about a melody is who is going to play it or sing it? Instrumentally, the character of instruments are all so different that there are certain types of melodies that sound better on that instrument than that one. I mean, like, a, like for instance, the, 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 the opening phrase of the Brahms B-flat would not sound as good on, a, on an English horn as it does on a French horn. And vice versa, I could think of, if I could, some wonderful oboe things that would not sound good on the violin or a clarinet. So it depends what you're writing for as to, I think, how the melody should be constructed. And as far as singers are concerned, it's, it's very much um, dependent on the words. Because I think f f for singers, when, I, when I'm working with singers, when I produce singers, the, the very first thing I say to them when they come to the studio is, look, you don't need to impress me with your chops, because if you didn't have any, you wouldn't be here. <laughs> what I need you to do is to tell me this story. So forget about the music. Just sing me the words. Well... If they're halfway good, they can sing the melody and they can sing it beautifully, but it's, it's, it's the words. But the words are helped by how the melody is constructed. You know, when we speak, I mean, if, if you're speaking a piece of Shakespeare, there's, there's modulations in the voice. It's, it's like a, a spoken melody. Uh, which, I mean, particularly if you've got something like Olivier doing it, it's completely melody. It's music what he does it comes out of his mouth. And that's what you have to do, I think, with music. You have to, you have to tailor the music to, to make the most of whatever words it is you're, you're setting. You know? Do you think that the reason we were talking about the zeitgeist, which I think we both share a distaste for, but the reason that people like this uh, rather dim reviewer yes. couldn't appreciate the unbelievably moving melodic content no, of your see. record is because... He's had no exposure to it at all, and so therefore, you know, we talk about a melody as being affecting because it, it resonates with some kind of truth in us. But to him, he didn't know what to make of it because he has no experience. No, but what he said, you see, what's strange, there, there are several things. While I was making the record, I have a, f a friend, a young French musician who lives in Paris. He asked if he could come over and just kibitz while we were making the album. So he did. He came over, and he was, he was wonderful. He sat at the back of the control room for a week. He never said a word. Never got in the way and everything. And after it was all over, about three weeks later, I got this wonderful letter from him. And in it, it one of the things he said, which was, which was, I thought, so good, he said what he loved about the music was that it took him to places unexplored. Now, I have, almost everybody I know that's heard that album has the same reaction to it. And, and one extraordinary thing happened. There's an English pub down in Santa Monica called The King's Head which up till about two years ago was run by a lovely Scottish lady. Um, when I say a very ordinary Scottish lady, I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I mean it's just, you know, just a regular person, right? And I gave her a copy of the album. Finally, I gave her a copy. She'd been asking for it for ages, and I kept forgetting, and then finally I gave it to her. And I go there every Saturday for lunch, and I get the English paper, and I read the paper, and I have some grungy English meal. <laughs> and I'll never forget that. The next Saturday I came in and she, she, she saw me come in the door and she walked to me with literally with tears in her eyes. And she said, God, she said, that album took me to Scotland. Now, I have no connection with Scotland at all. And it doesn't really matter. But what it did was it, it well, what did it do? It took her... It, it took her to a, a very special place in, in her life. 
And this is what has happened to everybody. I mean, I, I had the most extraordinary experience. When I, w w w quite soon after I'd made it, and it wasn't, it wasn't all fancy done up. I had to make copies like I gave you. At that time in my life, I was working with a lot of very young black R&B producers. I absolutely adore all of them because I love their music. And um, two of them, they were both like 24, 25 years old. I worked with two of them in the space of a month, neither of whom knew each other. And I gave each of them a copy of the album. And both of them, I swear to God, both of them called me up and said exactly the same thing. I mean, it was so the same that it was really spooky. And I had to make sure they didn't know each other, which was, the first one called me up one day and he said, I said, hello. He said, hey man. I said, yeah, what's up? He said, you're fucking with my life. I said, I'm <laughs> extremely sorry to hear that. <laughs> I said, what seems to be the problem? He says, I ain't been to bed for two days. He said, I've been listening to this fucking thing for 48 hours. So that's, and, and he said to me, which was the best thing he could have said. He said, man, this is soul music. Now, in his term, soul music is, is Marvin Gaye. But I know what he means. You see, unfortunately, the, the, the term soul music has been narrowed down to this black whatever, you know, which of course is rubbish. I mean, half the good music we listen to is soul music of one kind or another, you know. So that's the kind of effect it's, it's had on people, you know. It's, it's, been, it's been really remarkable. Mm. Well, I, I heartily agree with that. And uh, the thing is, I, I find it unfortunate that music has to be so rigidly categorized into generic groups so that that would even be un unusual to hear that or that you would have to say that you know that of course we're all we all are human beings we're black white green exactly, whatever exactly. and it's music of the soul of yes. course it's soul music well let me tell you this that in the 10 years that it took to find a record company we showed it to every big company and at least half of them i mean and i'm talking about the top guy said i love this album but my marketing people don't know what to do with it well, you and I both know that half the people who work in the music industry should be selling carpets. I mean, they have absolutely <laughs> no... Because if it isn't in a prescribed pigeonhole, they don't know what to do with it. They have no... I, I was talking to somebody the other day, quite high up in the music business, when some label, I forget exactly who it was, actually. And I said to him, the thing I don't understand about marketing is... If somebody outside the music business um, creates a new product, like a new soap or a new, I don't know what, they go to an advertising agency and they say, look, nobody's seen this before, this is something completely new, sell it. So they rack their brains and they find a way to sell this thing that nobody's ever seen before. And I said to the guy, why the hell can people do that in the record industry? Well, because they don't have the brain power, they don't have the, you know, they don't have the, and they don't have the incentive, and, 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 and the line of least resistance is to do something that's easy to market rather than something that's difficult. Mm. So. And, and as a result, record companies have been losing record sales at 10% a year for the last 10 years. <laughs> so it's not even a commercially good decision for them to do so, no. which is my, my argument about right. it. Um, Jeremy, I have three words to say. If they're real words, you, the man, because I love to hear you rant so much. I, I was going to try and get you, you, you know, because I, I thought you can't, you can't use that off this stuff. Oh, yes, I can. Radio Richard is a unique collection of my interviews with fellow creators, revealing not only how they do that voodoo that they do so well, but why. So please like, share, subscribe and donate so I can keep this channel going and give you this great content. Radio Richard, be informed, be amazed, be inspired.